Hello, everyone. We wanted to welcome you today to the Word Wise Christian Broadcast. We're so glad you could join us today because we've learned from experience that regular teaching from God's Word will build a foundation of faith inside your heart and set us all on a course for success in every area of our life. You know, God sent us His Word that, so that we could get our thinking straightened out. His wisdom is found in His Word, and it will speak to every generation because His Word never changes. You know, Jesus said that if you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. You know, that's so true. There's just nothing like the peace that comes when we have the mind of the Lord in any given situation in our life. When his thinking becomes our own, we become word-wise, and the results are always success and victory. So let's take a Bible, take some notes, and let's study the word together. Let's become word wise. Well, there we are. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome our live stream audience here to Church on the Word this morning. Good to have you. <laughs> God bless you. As is my general rule, we'll give you a quick announcement. Church on the Word is an interdenominational, non denominational, interdenominational, however you want to say it. Full Gospel Church that Janie and I, my wife and I, began in 1994 at the Lord's direction. We started with a $100 bill and a prayer and 37 people. The following Sunday, we had 22 people. The following Sunday, we had 18. The week after that, we had 12. The week after that, we had a no-show. So we knew we were called to this from its inception. And uh, so after we ran everybody off it appeared they began to come piecemeal one at a time two at a time three at a time until finally uh we are responsible Janie and i together the best we can figure we're responsible for about 125 or 130 people or so that i know of and then i have many sheep that are not of my fold i'm on retainer 24 hours a day pro bono for many that are, would call from anywhere at any time day or night and uh but that's true with any pastor any shepherd our job is to watch for your souls and feed you the word. And as newborn babes, you're to desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. If so be, you've tasted that the Lord is gracious. So, having said all that, we want you to know we're facing our 19th year now in ministry. And uh, we have seen multiple new births take place, multiple healings take place, any number of bab Holy Ghost baptisms take place, water baptisms countless numbers of child dedications and uh, we're still here and uh, testimony after testimony sits here with us this morning because of that a pastor if among the five-fold ministry offices there's the apostle the prophet the evangelist the pastor and the teacher and you can depict those in, on the the five fingers of the hand I'm a pastor I have the covenant ring of love as a pastor with a mercy motive I can't do it all by myself God calls more pastors than he calls any other ministry of office office of ministry and um, but that's because he loves his people wants them seen to and wants them watched over and cared for on an up-close personal basis but he also calls other offices of ministry to work in tandem with that pastor's office and when an evangelist comes in to help a pastor He'll leave in his wake, if he's a true New Testament evangelist, a blessing to that church with new families and new blessing and new freedom and new liberty and not just rake off the top and leave. Also, the prophet and the teacher functions in tandem with the pastor from time to time. A pastor will function in the gifts of the Spirit. And this I won't get into all this today, but just to share with you, the pastor will function from time to time in, in a word of knowledge or word of wisdom. But that primarily operates in the office of the prophet. The prophet's office is New Testament. You'll find it in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, the prophet's office was foretelling. In the New Testament, the prophet's office is forthtelling. A prophet speaks for God to the people, and he is signified by the index finger because he's the finger pointer. With a mercy motive and a prophet's motive operating in tandem in his ministry, you'll find that he has a good word, an instructive word, but a word of blessing and edification. 
when he has also with him the ability to teach. Some prophets do not, but when one has also the ability to teach, it is one of the most fabulous, most phenomenal, most wonderful ministries in all of the earth. In uh, 1990, at a meeting in this county, I met for the first time Jason Peebles, who's with us today. I'm billing him to you today as a prophet and a teacher because I have, as a pastor, seen his office of ministry function in the multiple offices of ministry, the mul multiple function of ministry that he functions in, I'll call it. I find him to be a modern day Gordon Lindsay. He uh, has an administrative gift and his administrative gift has also allowed him to help more than 200 missionaries worldwide as his missionary servicing agency services those missionaries around the world. He functions as a teacher, a prophet, and as a, or I'll say it accurately according to the scripture, a prophet and a teacher and an administrator in the body of Christ. He is the most straight up operator that I have ever known. His anointing will bless you beyond imagination. His beautiful daughter's here with him today. He's a graduate of Royal Roberts University and his future is very, very bright. We are privileged here to have him both at Church on the Word and by our live stream audience. At this time, please welcome the prophet and the teacher, Jason Peoples. Thank you. Well, God bless you. You may be seated. Find your way to the book of St. John. We're going to start there in just a moment. The book of St. John. Wow, what an introduction. I think I might go back and just listen to that over and over. <laughs> Thank you, brother. It's good to be back here uh, at Church on the Word. I, I always love coming here, and I, I don't just say that. In fact, uh, you know, for 27 years, I just traveled nonstop. I really did. 27 years, I traveled nonstop, crisscrossed the world. And uh, I guess I'm at a phase in my life now with the missionary organization, the way it's developed and grown, that uh, I've really cut back on my travels, and I'm very selective. This is one place that I always love coming to, and I always want to continue to come to. As long as the door is open, I will come. Um, as he said, I have my, my beautiful daughter, Joanna. Joanna, would you just stand up and uh, would everybody greet my daughter, Joanna? She is our office manager and uh, I work with her every day. And you know, people say, well, how is that working with your daughter every day? Is that kind of tough? And I'm like, no, it's, it's wonderful. You know, we have fun. And uh, she's got three ladies that work under her. And as uh, Pastor said, the missionary agency has grown to, we're about 227 full-time missionaries uh, that we do all their office work for them. I mean, if you're living in Guatemala or if you're in Africa, uh, who's going to pick up your mail? Who's going to process your mail? Who's going to make deposits for you in the bank? So we do for them what uh, they can't do for themselves. Um, I want you to write this title down, and those of you that uh, are joining us through uh, live streaming, uh, get your Bibles out as well. We're going to start in St. John chapter 5 in just a moment, but I want to share with you uh, this morning and tonight on practicing the presence of God. Practicing the presence of God. Uh, before I get too far into that, I am ministering out of this CD album. Uh, there are six CDs in here, Abiding in His Presence, Practicing His Presence, Ten Benefits of Praise and Worship, How to Activate Your Prophetic Capacity, The Healing Power of Praise, and Doorway to the Miraculous. That's this album entitled the power of praise and worship. So this one is back there. That's the one I'm kind of jumping off of uh, this morning and tonight. Now, we've got a couple of other ones. There's one called Psychological Warfare. Uh, some of you picked this up, I think, the last time I was here. But, you know, the, the, the warfare that we face is spiritual, but the battlefield is the mind. Isn't that right? So, you know, it's a little bit... Uh, misleading to say we're in a spiritual warfare. I mean, that is true, but the battlefield normally is in the mind. And so this set on psychological warfare is just, it's the set you need. If you're going through attacks mentally, or you've got friends that are uh, being attacked mentally, that would be a great one to have. And then uh, the third album that we have is called Abiding in Christ. 
And to me, that's the center of the universe. And that, that ties into what we'll be talking about this morning about um, practicing the presence of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the Holy Spirit, who is our great teacher. And we ask that this morning and tonight that the Holy Spirit would teach us, instruct us. Uh, we thank you for the Word, and we ask that the Word just become alive to us. I want everyone to say this out loud. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit. I, yield my heart. I yield my heart. I yield my mind, yield my mind. To, your to your teaching ministry. Change my life. Change my life. Move me to higher ground. Me to higher ground. In, Jesus name. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right, practicing the presence of God, you know, when you first hear that, it, it may seem like a misnomer. I mean, the presence of God is everywhere. Uh, for the believer, the presence of God is within you. But uh, once you become familiar with the Word, you begin to realize there's a lot of dimensions to your personality. Isn't that right? I mean, in the simplest form, the Bible says there's an outer man and there's an inner man. The outer man, of course, would be your physical body. The inner man would be everything on the inside. And uh, we can break that down even further. The Bible talks about the soulish realm, or to put it in more modern terminology, the mental realm, the emotional realm. And so it's one thing to have the presence of God in you by the Holy Spirit in your spirit. It's another thing to have the presence of God active in your soulish realm. To put it another way, you can be a Christian, Jesus lives in you, but your mind can be a million miles away from Him. And so we all face that at times. I mean, if you're an honest person, you know that's true. You get focused on the task at hand or focused on an issue or a problem. You get sidetracked. It's like, oh, yeah, I could pray about this. <laughs> oh, yeah, I, you know, it might be a good idea to consult with God. It's like I once heard, you know, a little uh, cute joke. Uh, it wasn't a joke. I mean, I think it was a report. And that, and that was that, you know, the, the deacons were having a deacon meeting you know, uh, commonly known as devil meetings. No, they were having a deacon meeting, trying to figure out what to do. And they were debating back and forth. And finally, one of them said, you know what? They were all stressed out. You know how those kind of meetings can get at times, whether it's elders meeting, deacon meeting, or some kind of committee meeting. And so finally, one said, you know what? We haven't even prayed about this. And then one other brother said, has it come to that? <laughs> do we have to pray about it? And so often we go through life like that and we forget that the presence of God is where our solutions can be found. This, the presence of God is where we need to be. And by the way, uh, where, where did Steve go? Uh, keyboard, is he in here still? I want you to, at the end of the service, we're going to go back to that uh, song, the, one of the last ones that you led us in about the presence. I want to go back to that because I, I just love that song. All right, St. John chapter 5, and let's look at a, a verse where Jesus gives us a great deal of insight into how he operated. Verse 30, St. John chapter 5, verse 30. Jesus said, I can of mine own self do nothing. Now that's pretty amazing that the Son of God would say, I can of my own self do nothing. Can you, do you believe that? Jesus of Nazareth said, I can of my own self do nothing. That was, that was his view of himself. I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge. Now, let's, let's take that word judge and let's put another word in there. Uh, I decide. In other words, that's the way I judge, I analyze, I make my decisions. He says, I can of my own self do nothing, as I hear I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father who has sent me. Ah, there we are. Jesus is saying, the secret to my success. Can I just paraphrase it a little bit? The secret to my success. Now, you've got to understand, the people listening to him were just in utter amazement. I mean, this is the guy who's raising the dead healing the sick. They've never seen such. Not only was he teaching, he was demonstrating. And so, I mean, it was one thing to, you know, there, there were a lot of Pharisees and Sadducees and, and rabbis at the time, but nobody had the kind of uh, delivery of goods that this man had. So when, when he said, I can't, of, I, don't, I can't of my own self do nothing, I'm powerless in and of myself, I'm sure their ears perked up. It's like, what? 
I mean, we've seen it. He says, here's my secret. I'm in the Father's presence. I'm hearing what the Father is saying to me. And so when we talk about this idea of practicing the presence of God, I want you to understand that, yes, Jesus is in you by the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit needs to manifest into your soulish realm. That is your mind, your thought life, your emotions, your decision-making uh, capacity. And that's where you need to say, Lord, I want to practice that is yielding to your influence in my life so that I can operate like Jesus operated. As I hear, I make a decision. As I hear, I judge. Amen? Amen. Put your hand right here, and pastor had us do this earlier, but, you know, we're talking about, the, the Bible talks about the belly. It's like, oh, the belly, you know, I see all kind of shows on TV, like how to lose some of that belly. <laughs> But when the Bible talks about the belly, it, it's referring metaphorically to the spirit, your spirit on the inside of you. Everybody say, my spirit, my spirit. is connected to God. Connected to God. Now, now, my spirit, my spirit needs, to needs to connect to my mind. And see, that's the truth of the matter. If you're a Christian, the Holy Spirit lives in you. The Holy Spirit lives in you. The Bible says that he that's joined to the Lord is one spirit. Don't turn there, but you may want to jot this down. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13 says, When you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So the good news is, you've got God on board. Amen? Amen. You know, I've seen these uh, new, new mothers, you know, they have the sticker on the back of their van or the car that says, Baby on board. Well, we ought to have one that says, Jesus on board. I've got Jesus on board. But I have to practice. That is, I need to wake up every day saying, okay, today's a new day. I choose to yield. I choose to yield and I desire to hear and I desire to discern. I desire to know what God knows about the situations that I'm facing. That is going to be your secret to success. He says in verse 30, let's read it again, because I seek not mine own will. Well, see, there's, there's what determines whether that connection will take place or not. Because if you're waking up during the day like, I'm just going to do what I want to do, doesn't matter what God thinks about it, what God says, if I'm going to do what I want to do, then you've broke the connection before it even gets started. But if you wake up saying, Lord, I've got ideas and I've got desires, obviously, uh, about this and that and the other, but... Your will trumps it all. And if that is your posture and if that is your inclination, then it's like turning the, the light switch on. That is the first step for the connection taking place. Now, there's other things involved, and we're going to talk about some of the equipment. All right? If I can just put it to you that way, we're going to be talking about some of the equipment on how the presence of God can manifest more in your life. How many of you would like to, to step into that? Regardless of how old you are as a believer, there's room for growth. Amen? Amen. Whether you're a, new, a brand new believer or you whether you walk with the Lord for 50 years, we always need to be pressing in and practicing the presence of God. But he says here, Because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which has sent me. Amen. Let me just show you another verse along these lines. Back up to, let's go to verse 19. Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of Himself. There it is again. I want you to mark that in verse 19. Now, we need to have that, that attitude. I just turned 60. I just had my birthday in February. I just turned 60. And uh, I think back, you know, when I was a younger man, I'm not sure I really believe that. I can of my own self do nothing. In fact, I was pretty well convinced that me and Jesus could whip the world. I said, me and Jesus. And though I didn't, I wouldn't have said that. I mean, I was religiously smart enough not to say things like that. But I think that was kind of your attitude is, you know, that you're, you're young, you got your whole life in front of you, you got full of energy. And it's like, uh, by the way, Jesus, I'm going on a mission trip. Would you like to come? Okay, I think I'll just tag along and see how you do. 
And the older I've gotten, and, and of course, being through uh, suffering, being through uh, problems, tests and trials, seeing loved ones die, you know, the older you get, the more your friends start dying off. And uh, you begin to have a different perspective about life. It starts when you begin to, I think, when you get married and, and then you start raising children and, you know, you enter into a relationship in marriage and all of a sudden you realize that everything can't revolve around you. <laughs> and about the time you think you've got it mastered and, and you're finally at peace with this one person, all of a sudden here comes this new baby into the world. And they just are there to remind you, Mama and Papa, things don't revolve around you. I'm here. And wow, everybody say wow. wow. So you begin to understand this thing about the, the battle of wills and all that ties in. If you're an alert and astute person to the will of God, you begin to see that, you know what, I could, I could do a whole lot better at yielding to the will of God than what I did earlier. And so I, where I'm at in my life right now is I want the will of God more than anything. And I really mean that. I want God's will. I hope next year I'll want God's will even more. But I really want God's will in my life. And we've seen such phenomenal uh, growth. And, and, and I'm saying that not like, uh, that's not like an advertisement or trying to, uh, you know, get people interested in the ministry. I mean, before, just a few years ago, when I was selling insurance to, to supplement my income, that's true. I was selling insurance to supplement my income and uh, focused primarily on life insurance and so forth. Um, I really began to wonder after some events had transpired in my life if, you know, the ministry was doomed. I really did. I thought, well, this may be just the way it's going to end. We've had a good ride up to here and uh, we've helped a lot of people and this is maybe the way it's going to end. And I just began to cry out to God and seek God and I finally got to the point, I said, Lord, if, if you don't want me in the ministry, then I want what you want. Whatever you want from this point forward. I'm tired of analyzing what could have been, should have been, might have been. I'm tired of trying to analyze, you know, my mistakes, their mistakes, and what percentage everybody had in the, in the outcome of things. Uh, it's under the blood. Thank God it's under the blood. Now, Lord, I, this is the way I got. I finally got to the point. And, you know, in my early days, the will of God was this nice little linear line. Well, by the time I got through with things, it was like took a nosedive here and went in circles down here and went off the chart, came back up for air, went back down. And finally, I just decided, you know, I'm quit trying to map out the will of God for my life. The will of God is now. The will of God is now. And so I made up my mind. I did. I said, Lord, I've proved this. As, as, as Jay said, I've proved this. I can of my own will do nothing. And so from this point forward, Lord, to the best of my ability, I want the best you have for me. And I began to, to seek God and just ha and go into it, not with an agenda, but go into it with like, I have desires, yes, and I have goals. I'm not saying I'm a, a person without goals. I have goals, but that is going to from now on be very submitted to what God wants. And I even got to the point, I, I was enjoying the insurance thing. I really did and, and, and doing well at it. And I thought, well, if the Lord wants me to do this, I can reach people doing insurance. Doesn't matter to me. I really got to that point. Not just theoretically, I got to that point. In fact, I got to the point, I said, you know, I think I've had about enough of that ministry stuff. <laughs> you know, and I don't ever desire to go to another minister's convention. Those guys are just, you know, all, you know, and, and, and I'd gotten to that to all, almost too much. And so I said, Lord, what do you want? And God began to speak to me. Now, I want you to see this in this verse. Verse 19 says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the Father do. Now, in the verse previously, in verse 30, he says, As I hear, I judge, right? Now, he's saying, What I see the Father do. Did you know that there's a seeing by the Spirit? There's a hearing by the Spirit. There's a feeling by the Spirit. There's a knowing by the Spirit. Every one of your senses and every one of your mental, mental faculties, there is the counterpart of it in the Spirit. 
I'm going to say that again. Every one of your five senses and every function of your mental and emotional capacities, there is a counterpart of it in the spirit. They're not always the same. Now, Christian development and growth is when they begin to mesh as one. So when you think, you're thinking by the Spirit. When you feel, you're feeling by the Spirit. When you analyze a situation and try to make a decision, you're, you've got the Spirit involved. That's really what Christian development and maturity is all about. A baby carnal Christian is when they're completely separate. And this all goes back to Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve, before sin, they walked in complete harmony. They didn't have to go like, oh my gosh, we haven't had our quiet time today, Eve. Go get the Bible. The Bible indicates that every day they walked with God, they fellowshiped with God. It says the voice of God came in the cool of the evening. It indicates they had this union and communion, and we're going to be getting to that, of the Spirit where there was no breach or separation of the soul and the Spirit. The soul and the Spirit were as one. When they thought, they thought the thoughts of God. When they made decisions, they made decisions to the point that God said, I want you to have dominion over all the earth. Now, can you imagine what would have happened if they had never sinned where we would be today? Well, I, we have some inklings of it because it says, it tells us that when it's all said and done and uh, we've gotten our resurrected bodies, it says we will rule and reign with Christ uh, forever over a new heaven and a new earth. So the existing universe as we know it, the galaxies, the stars, and... and uh, the solar systems they're now discovering and they've got these long range things that are discovering planets that will all be changed there'll be a new universe there'll be a new earth a new heavens and God's will is that I think we extend his dominion and reign throughout the universe without end it's gonna be rather exciting <laughs> it's gonna be rather exciting and you know man's uh, attempts to you know they, they, explore and go further and go further. That's just an innate thing that God put within mankind that's only going to be fulfilled when we rule and reign with Christ. You know, heaven to me is not some little uh, place where goody, good people go and sit around all day and tell Bible stories. You know, heaven is the dominion and rule of God. Adam and Eve had this connection. When they sinned, their soul and their spirit were pulled apart so that they could begin to function independently without God. And the whole redemption plan has been to put us back together. The whole redemption plan is that you're saved and then learning how your soul and your spirit can come back together. That's what renewing the mind and so forth is all about. Are you getting anything out of this? Now he says in verse 19, The Son can do nothing of Himself but what He sees the Father do. For whatsoever things He does, these also does the Son likewise. Now don't miss verse 20. I want you to mark verse 20 because this is a verse for you. For the Father loves the Son and shows Him all things. Now I, I, wanna, I want you to understand that when you begin to walk in, in loving God more and more, revelation knowledge will begin to flow your way. Do you see that there? It says, For the Father loves the Son and shows Him all things that Himself does, and He will show Him greater works than these that you may marvel. So, here's the deal. If you'll just make a step, a small step today, and that is to say, I want God's will more than anything. More than I've ever wanted it, I want God's will. Whatever that means, I want God's will then God will take 10 steps towards you and begin to show, begin to reveal, you'll begin to hear, you'll begin to see. And the more that you are in love with Him, the more the revelation knowledge will come. Yes. Now, back to this story about uh, some years ago when I was wondering through events in my life if, if I was done you know, in the ministry and what might happen. I began to just pray and seek God, and, and, and I'm not talking about, it's not like a one-time prayer, okay? It was like a process of about uh, three years that this was taking place in my life, where I was uh, crying out to God, and, and sometimes with tears. Uh, I was living alone, uh, and, and so forth like that, and, and it was very hard. It was very hard. You know, you go from a family situation to all of a sudden living alone. And uh, 
I'd lost my son at uh, age 19, and it was a very difficult time. And so I was just crying out to God, crying out to God. And this took place over a period of about three years. And then God began to speak to me very specifically. I mean, he was speaking to me the whole time, but mostly it was just, I love you. I'm with you. I've not given up on you. Don't listen to them. Don't listen to them. For goodness sakes, don't listen to them. <laughs> listen to me. And most of it was just edification, exhortation, comfort, reminding me of scriptures. Uh, you can do this. You can sell insurance, you know. And I mean, if you've ever been in the insurance world, you really have some interesting people that you deal with at times. Now, I could go there and spend the rest of the evening, afternoon. But uh, I remember one time I went into the, this lady. She loved cats. And I mean, I'm not, I, I like cats. And, and, and if you like cats, I'm not, I'm not saying anything bad about cats. But it was obviously she liked cats because when in her house, there's about 50 of them. In fact, I began to refer to her with all the other agents as the cat woman. The original cat woman. And uh, she bought an insurance policy and, and uh, for about a million dollars, I think it was, a life insurance policy for a million dollars, and left. When I got down to the beneficiary part, I thought it was a joke, and, but I learned not to laugh, you know, as an insurance agent. You just go, uh-huh, okay, let me make a call about that. So I called up my supervisor and I said, can we uh, leave a life insurance policy to the, whatever it was, XYZ Cat uh, Foundation? And he goes, you just put down there whatever she wants if she wants to buy the policy. She can leave it to any organization she wants to. I'm like, okay, yes, we can. Uh, what was the name of that? The XYZ Cat Company. And uh, that's what she did her policy for. And I left out of there just going like, wow, Jesus. Everybody say, wow, Jesus. And so, you know, this was all happening during, during this process that I was going through. And, and the Lord was using all this in my life. I, I said, Lord, what am I doing uh, at the cat woman's house. I mean, I'm this anointed man of God. I mean, you know, <laughs> I know you've never thought things like that, but I'm like, don't I deserve better? <laughs> Have I sinned so bad that you now send me to the cat woman's house? <laughs> I know you never thought things like that, but I did. But in the process of all of this, the Lord began to speak to me and he said, uh, very specifically said, I want you to redo the website. Now, you know, you don't need God to understand websites. There's people that are not Christians that have websites, but the timing of it all. And the Lord began to show me how this website was to be constructed. If you go to our website, uh, which is worldoutreach.org, if you want to write that down, it's, it's worldoutreach, one long word, worldoutreach.org, worldoutreach.org. And uh, it's hard to find my picture on there. Now, I'm not against, you know, people promoting their own ministries and self and so forth like that because normally most ministries are a lot about the person but in in the missionaries case our ministry is about the missionaries and so I had to completely reverse my thinking so that no longer was the ministry going to be about Jason Peebles and his teaching ministry and uh, so forth and, and like that because if you looked at my other website it's like hard to miss my face you know what I'm saying I had pictures of me I had pictures of me. I had pictures of me with the Bible, Billy Graham style. And I had pictures of me. I had pictures of me. I mean, and, 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 uh, and I'm, not, I'm not saying people that have pictures of themselves are wrong, okay? Because if, if you go to like Kenneth Copeland or, or Joyce Meyer or Billy Graham or these wonderful ministers of God, obviously they're going to have pictures of themselves because their ministry is primarily their ministry. But when you start ministering for missionaries, you got to, yeah, but so it was a really flip me around in my thinking. Are you following me? The Lord began to, to tell me things to do and, and things to change and things like that. And, and it was a learning experience for me because it kind of went against the grain of the way I was raised and the, you know, coming up under Oral Roberts, you know, and, and things like that. So, but we made these changes. And at that time, don't quote me on this, but it was certainly less than 100. We had like 60 families or so that we were helping missionaries and now we're up to 227. I mean, before I was like, you know, pushing this boulder uphill, help me Jesus, and very concerned that it was going to roll back on me and crush me. 
I mean, we were within a few days of uh, the building at one point. The, we have a very nice office suite that we uh, are purchasing, we own, uh, in a beautiful office complex. And you know how you can buy office condominiums? Well, we were within a few days of foreclosure. I mean, that's how, how bad things had gotten. And uh, I, I, I was like, Lord, I don't know what to do. I, all I know is I don't want to quit. I don't want to quit. And the Lord began to speak to me in the middle of that. And now the ministry has such momentum. This will be the first year in a while. Our, our annual income will be well over $5 million this year. I figured it up the other day. It'll be well over $5 million. Now, that money comes in and it goes out. So don't look at me like I'm a millionaire. I'm not a millionaire. But we are stewards over that. And this money comes in for these missionaries and it has to go out. But God took us from 60 or, or so families. Now we've got 227, and, and Joanna will verify this. We have, I have a stack of inquiries that are that high on my desk right now from all over the world. Yesterday, an inquiry came in from a, a, a missionary in Papua New Guinea. Huh. And through a series of events, you know, some of them, they had their mom doing it, or they had a church doing it. We've heard all kinds of stories. Hey, the church was processing our stuff, and the church went through a split. Uh, my mom was doing it and she's now elderly, can't do it. I mean, and so there are these missionaries that are all over the world that need a dependable home office to help them and that's what we do. It's not rocket science, but we do it and we do it with excellence. Yeah, right. And so, you know, the, the work of God is not rocket science, but I'll tell you, I'll tell you the main quality that, it, that God looks for. He doesn't look for your education. He doesn't look for your skills or your good looks. God primarily looks for something called faithfulness. And so, you know, for 34 years, this is our 34th year in ministry this year, for 34 years, letters have gone out, whether I felt good, didn't feel good, whether I was living at the motel for a year or not, letters went out for the missionaries faithful. That's about the only thing I can claim to my credit is that I, if I say I'm going to do it, I will do my doggone best to get it done. Amen. And so that's what the missionaries are looking for is faithfulness. Well, now, I'm not pushing a boulder uphill. I feel like I'm on a... Have you ever been on a sled before? Well, maybe back when you were younger. Maybe you can remember like you had this great idea. I'm going to go to the top of the hill and I'm going to go down on this sled or the top of a trash can or whatever it was, you know, and you didn't realize how fast that thing was going to go. And you got on it and you just, all of a sudden like, where are the brakes? There are no brakes on this. And uh, you're headed down this hill, and oh my God, there's a road at the bottom. And there's cars that are out of control because, you know, it's icy down there, and here you go. And you're just like, help! I kind of feel like that right now. It's going so fast. The ministry's going so fast. There's been a complete turnaround. Now, I'll tell you why. It's because of this thing, the presence of God. It's because of these very simple verses we're reading where you come to the revelation, I can of mine own self do nothing, but as I hear, I'll make a decision. As I see, I'll follow. Are you there? Are you getting anything out of this? Go with me to 1 John chapter 1. Toward the back of the Bible, 1 John chapter 1. And don't you just love verses that kind of boil it down to what it's all about? I just like verses that just, let's just go to the core and let's just find out what it's all about. This is one of those passages. 1 John chapter 1, verse 1. That which was from the beginning. Okay, that's, that's good. Let's start in the beginning. Amen? Yes. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which you've looked upon, which our, ha our hands have handled of the word of life. Now, you've got to remember, this is the disciple John. And he had a little advantage that we don't have. He actually saw Jesus, not in the spirit. He saw, he saw the man, Jesus. He heard the man, Jesus. He had touched the man, Jesus. He had eaten with the man, Jesus. He says, that which we heard, that's what we're declaring unto you. Verse 2, for the life was manifested, talking about the life of God, was manifested in a baby. We have seen it 
and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which is with the Father which was manifested unto us. Now, I want you to put a mark around verses 3 and 4 because this is what it's all about, honey. Verses 3 and 4 is what it's all about. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, underline this, that. When it, whenever you see the word that, it means for the purpose of. That you may also have fellowship with us, and our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. Why do we share Jesus in Ethiopia? Why do we share Jesus in North America? Why do we share Jesus in Papua New Guinea? Why do we... Uh, assume that other cultures need Jesus. There's religions all over the world that believe this, that, and the other because we know and we're convinced that Jesus died for our sins and rose from the dead. And why would we declare this? Because we want them to enter into this practicing the presence, the fellowship, the communion. You could say it any number of ways. We want them to be connected to God the Father and God the Son just like we are. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. John said, why are we, we are declaring what we've seen and heard and we know is true so that you may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son. You take that out of the formula and you've got nothing but religion. You take that idea of fellowship and communion with God out of your Christianity and you're left with an empty, hollow religion. And there are churches all across America that have the cross in them where people sit there Sunday after Sunday religiously and then go their merry way and they don't seek the will of God. They don't ask for God to speak to them. They don't listen. They don't hear. And you know what? No wonder they don't want to go to church. It's just boring. Everybody say boring. boring. But I'm telling you what, when you finally get tapped into a God who'll speak to you, everybody say exciting. exciting. Amen. Amen. Verse 4. And these things write we unto you that your joy may be full. Isn't that interesting? Immediately following the fellowship is the joy. And I'll tell you what, through that dark hour, well, it was a long hour. <laughs> through that dark period that I went through, there wasn't a lot of joy. I'll be honest with you. There just wasn't a lot of joy in my life at that time. But now I can honestly say, you know, God has healed me in so many ways. He's healed me of rejection, feeling rejected when somebody divorces you and you don't want the divorce. He's healed me of when my son died at an early age and all those questions that a parent would have. I mean, here you are praying for them from their birth, laying hands on them, send them to Christian school, and on and on you go. And all the questions, not, not, the hurts is one thing, but then the questions is another. And you know, I'm good now. Everybody say Jason's good. I know he can't come to me, but I'll go to him, like David said. I will see him again. He was born again. He was confused at the end, but he was born again. I, I, I know that. That's not just a hopeful thing I'm saying. I mean, I, I saw my son walk with Jesus, and he used to take the youth group out and go to the mall and, you know, lead people to Christ. But you can be a, a, a Christian and get confused and make bad decisions. How many of you know there's Christians that are alcoholics? Now, see that if you're a religious person, you don't understand that. But there's people that love Jesus who've let their guard down. The devil's gotten into their thought life and into their, into their life, and they've got habits in their life that don't please God. That's true. And, and it can be anywhere on the spectrum there. But back to what we're talking about, practicing the presence of God. God wants us to develop this idea of fellowship and communion and union with Him where the soul and the spirit are reconnected. Amen? Yep. Where the soul and the spirit are reconnected. Everybody put your hands up like this. I did this the last time I was here, I think. This is my famous sleight of hand illustration. <laughs> now that we're streaming live, it could be the soon-to-be-famous worldwide sleight of hand <laughs> illustration. Everybody say, my right hand, my right hand. represents the Holy Spirit. And he is, he is excited. My left hand, my left hand represents, my represents my soul. 
it feels bad, <laughs> depressed, depressed at times. At times. But the Holy, Spirit the Holy Spirit wants to wake my soul up. Wake my soul up. Hey, soul, hey, soul, wake up. Wake up. Join, with Join with me. Start beating in harmony. harmony. Hear what I hear. hear what I hear. See, what I see. see what I see. Do what I do. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. And so really God is in the putting you back together business. And so if you've been, you know, if you're like, where am I on the will of God chart? Just forget that and just make a decision. The will of God is now. The will of God is now. Regardless of what's happened in my past, how I've been let down or how I've let other people down. Sometimes we beat ourselves up over our own sins. I made a mistake. I, I sinned. I did something that I thought I would never do. The blood of Jesus avails for your sins just like for other people. Amen. The will of God is now. Now, Lord, from this point forward, I want your will more than anything else. I want the remainder of my life, whether it's 20 years, 40 years, 50 years. I want the remainder of my life to count for you. If that means through selling insurance, I'll sell insurance. If that means through preaching, I'll preach. If that is through raising these children, I'll raise these children. We all have different phases in our life, and maybe you're in a different phase of life. Well, you know what? Five years from now, you'll probably be in a different phase. And so I've started looking at my life not so much as this linear uh, you know, will of God, as assignments. I'm on assignment now. Right now, I was on assignment in insurance. Now I'm on assignment with a missionary agency. I think it'll be the rest of my life, but that's God's call. Right now, I'm on assignment, and I'm going to be faithful to hear and discern based on my union and communion with the Lord. Are you getting anything? Now, he said, go back to before we leave this, verse 3. That which we have seen and heard. Now see, there's the seeing and there's the hearing. That which we've seen and heard. That which we've seen and heard. Jesus said the same thing. What I hear, I do. What I see, I do. Are you getting this? That which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you that you may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And that's going to take you to where you really want to be. That's the joy. You'll have joy. You'll have the joy. Now, let's go together to uh, Acts chapter 2. And I'm going to shift gears just a little bit. I want to talk about communication equipment. Let's talk about communication equipment. And we're going to look at Acts chapter 2 here in just a moment. Just the first few verses and maybe see them in a little different light than... Perhaps you've seen them before. Well, let's talk about the, the uh, development of communication equipment. Back in the uh, days before there was even electricity, for instance, they had communication equipment. Drums. Smoke signals. Now, comparatively speaking, some of your Christian lives are right now on the drum level. That's all. You, I mean, you occasionally communicate with God, and it's by drums or smoke signals. It's not very sophisticated. You know, you have to actually attend a crusade and have an evangelist beat you up real hard, and finally you hear God to go down to the altar and repent again, hallelujah, and you've heard God. Well, you heard God, but He had to beat the drums to get you to hear anything. And some people, that's their testimony. I remember I heard God. Back in 1945, it was. You know, and they lived their whole life. Remember that one event where, my God, I saw the smoke signal come up over the horizon. God spoke to me. And that's a big deal. Well, it wasn't too long after the smoke signals and the drums. And by the way, you know, in the military, for instance, you think those guys were just going into battle, you know, drumming to, I don't know, get them pepped up or something. There were signals they gave out through those drums. And then the bugle, there are different sounds and tones that meant go forward or retreat or hold your ground. I mean, there, there was a communication there. 
finally somebody invented the telegraph. Everybody say, wow. wow. All of a sudden, man, you can like just sit there with a, a key pad and do the Morse code thing. Da -da 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 -da. And somebody on the other end. Now, back in those days, it wasn't wireless yet. It was through a line. But it sure was a huge improvement. And uh, I like watching the History Channel. Anybody like watching the History Channel? And they made the point uh, in, in talking about the Civil War and, and the advantages the North had versus the South and so forth like that. They said that that was the first war that a president ever waged uh, in the communication room. Lincoln maximized the telegraph. He maximized the telegraph. They had a telegraph war office and he would stay in touch with his generals through telegraph. And he would almost have instantaneous reports of battles while they were taking place through the telegraph. Now the South didn't have that and did not use it to their advantage. But Lincoln did. That was a huge factor according to the History Channel as to why the North was able to make strategic moves at times because they would know at headquarters where troop movements were, their lookouts and spies or other would report back, they'd relay it to another guy and they could maneuver and what an advantage that was. Now see some of you have gotten to the point where you've got telegraph. Are you getting this? But you're doing it through a line. You're not yet wireless. You're doing it through a line. You know, you got to have pastor tell you something or Janie, pastor Janie tell you something or you call up the 1-800 prayer tower tell you something. You got a little bit better going on. You're hearing God more than drums and smoke signals, but you're still kind of got to have a wire connected. Then all of a sudden there's a wireless. Everybody say wireless. wireless. Ooh, honey, we're cooking with grease. I mean, wireless. I'm, all of a sudden you can be anywhere and pull that deal out and, and go. You don't have to have the wires connected. You don't have to worry about the enemy snipping the wire because you're wireless. Could it get any better than wireless? You know? And all of a sudden you go wireless. Then in World War II, how many of you remember they had the telephones where now they were not only wireless, they were mobile. You remember the, how big those things were, those guys, those radios? It was kind of like, you know, cell phone that, honey, I shrunk the kids. It's honey, I blew up the cell phone. I mean, it's just like <laughs> this huge thing. And in World War II, they're talking like that. And they just thought, man, if every platoon had a walkie-talkie like that, I mean, we have an advantage. Are you getting anything out of this? Gradually, it's getting to the individual. That's where we're going with this. Gradually, it's going from headquarters, from the line, from wireless to this big walkie-talkie. Eventually, we're going to have where every person can be communicating. Are you getting anything? Now, in our military, most of these guys have built into the helmets a headset. You'll see them, special forces. You'll see a little microphone coming right down. And while they're moving in, you know, into the building or into the community, they're talking with one another and they're communicating back and forth. And now they can be linked up by satellite. Honey, now all of a sudden we've just trumped everything. We've gone satellite communication. Now I, I as a soldier, can be talking to a, uh, through satellite, I can be linked up to one of our armored divisions that's over there talking to him. And he goes, yeah, I'm only like six clicks out. I'll be there in 10 minutes. Okay, it's the building on the right. It's the tall one. It's got a white top on it. Blow the heck out of it. That's where the enemy is. And all of a sudden you just sit back and, and you're just cool because you're, you got knowledge that other people don't have. Everybody say, I've got knowledge. Everybody say, I got people. And so, you know, you guys in your platoon are like, well, you know, what are you so laid back about, man? They're laying down fire. Just, just hold it, hold it. I got knowledge that you have not. I've got people coming. Just hold your, just, just chill out. Get out one of your K rations if you want to. Have a little snack. And all of a sudden they hear, this, here comes this tank. Comes pulling up. This big Abram tank, all of a sudden, boom! The top of that building just dis disappears. Look at that, it's gone. <laughs> it's gone. And all of a sudden, the communication gear is important for you winning the battles of life. Acts chapter 2. We're familiar with this. Remember the day of Pentecost? 
I want you to write this in your notes. Just write it in your own shorthands. The day of Pentecost, just write this down. The day of Pentecost was a communication miracle. Maybe you've never seen it like that. We know it was the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We know the, the tongues of fire. But maybe you've never thought of it this way. The day of Pentecost was God bringing a communication miracle to His people. Now we're going to be, this is where we're going to pick up tonight, see, on this whole idea of how praying in the Spirit, how interpreting back to yourself in the Spirit, how the prophetic flow in your life can develop and grow. Why? So that you can have a walkie-talkie. You can do a little walkie and do a little talkie. You can do a little walkie and have a little talkie with Jesus. You can go wireless. Honey, you can even be, con you can even be satellite connected. Amen. Amen. Verse 1. Acts chapter 2, verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they... We're all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound. You know, I have people say, well, that's why it came, because they were all in one accord. Honey, if you read previously, they're all in fear and trembling for their lives. They're not in some kind of kumbaya, hmm, hmm, let's bring the presence of God home. They were just like, they were afraid for their life. That's all that means. Verse 2, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind. You know how we would say that now? They heard a jet engine. You know, a rushing mighty wind, we would say like the, the sound that people hear before a tornado hits, you know, or a jet engine. There'd be different ways we would say it now, but that's how loud it was. It was a loud sound that they heard. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire. Everybody say fire. fire. Now that's significance because fire to a Jew meant something. They remembered Moses at the what? Burning bush where God spoke to Moses. So when fire came, it was an indication that God was there to speak. Like as a fire, it set upon each of them, not just upon the important ones or upon the twelve. It set upon each of them. Everybody can now have satellite connection. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now look at this. The Holy Spirit is doing something in the individual believer's life. And it involves communication. They're speaking. They're speaking. There's a communication taking place. I'm going to get a little bit ahead here. It doesn't say this in this particular case, but, but get this, what the Holy Spirit was after, the Holy Spirit was after putting the soul back with the Spirit. The, the Spirit's influence, which was the fire, the, the, the ultimate goal was to communicate back with the soul so that there could be understanding. Now, in this case, he kind of bypassed their soul because they began to speak in a way that they didn't even understand. But the communication miracle is not through yet. Keep reading. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now, when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded. Now, look, mark this. Here's the other side of the communication miracle. Because that every man heard them speak in their own language. In this case, the miracle was the believers were speaking in whatever language at that time, Persian, uh, Assyrian, I don't know, Ethiopian, whatever languages were represented in that crowd, then a miracle hit their ear. So not only was there a miracle of speaking, there was a miracle of hearing. So these people started hearing about Jesus Christ had come as a baby. Jesus Christ had died for their sins. Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. You must have faith in Jesus Christ. There is a communication miracle taking place on the day of Pentecost. Was there emotions involved? Absolutely. I mean, if you have fire sitting on top of your head, you're going to probably get a little emotional. But that wasn't the point, you know. 
What, what, was there some fear and trepidation involved? I'm sure there was. If you hear a jet engine cranking up in the middle of an auditorium, it's going to get your attention. But that wasn't the point. The point was that communication by the Spirit was taking place through individual believers and a communication miracle of hearing the gospel in all these uh, languages represented from around the world was taking place and the Holy Spirit was saying, you can abide in His presence. You can hear His voice. You can see. You can hear. You can know. You can understand the will of God. Really, tongues, if you want to know, tongues for the believer, and, and in this case, this was tongues manifesting for unbelievers, but tongues for the believers, we will find out through the Apostle Paul, is a communication gift. It's, it's not just gibberish or, or hype, though some churches seem to maximize on that. The, really, what it's about is it's a communication piece of equipment that comes by the Holy Spirit meant to put your soul and the Spirit back in harmony so that you can understand what the will of God is. So when I begin to hear, Jason, I want you to redo the website. And this came through praying in the Spirit. Now, I had prayed in the Spirit, as I said, for about three years, and most of the time it was just scriptures or general encouragement. I love you. I've not given up on you. But all of a sudden, here comes very specific instruction. I want you to do this. I want you to do that. I want you to change this. I want you to change that. And since doing that, it's like I'm on the ride of my life. I am on a sled going downhill, and I'm like, are there any brakes on here, Lord? In fact, I said the other day, uh, and I'll just go ahead and, and, and tell you, you know, um, there's times I have doubts and so forth like that. I said the other day to Joanne and some of the ladies, I said, you know, this thing is just is about to get out of hand. <laughs> I said, I guess we do have the option if missionaries call up, just tell them we're not accepting uh, new uh, uh, missionaries at the moment. And Joanna didn't even blink an eye. She said, no, Dad, we're not saying that. You're not saying that. And then when I, when I came to myself, I'm like, yeah, why did I say that? Boy, that was really doubt and unbelief. I know y'all have never said doubt and unbelief, but sometimes it just pops out of my mouth. I don't know. Well, I do know. It's flesh. <laughs> Let's just call it what it is. It's just my own renewed mind. And, and, and I said that, and Joanna just, she didn't, didn't even miss a lick. She just said, no, we're not doing that. That is not what we're going to do. Oh, yes, ma'am. Okay. <laughs> Amen. And well, she's right. And, and there's other steps. And so you, as you walk in the Spirit, this is called walking in the Spirit. As you walk in the Spirit, what, the steps you took yesterday are not sufficient for today's journey. And today's journey, that's why it's called walking. It's not called sitting. It's not called running. It's walking. You walk in the Spirit, and it, it's like walking with a flashlight. You've all done it. Why won't the light go forward? This is a retard flashlight. The beam only goes six feet. I'm taking this back to Walmart or wherever you bought it. Now, you wouldn't do this because if you did, they would really think you're ready for the loony farm. You go back. This is a reject. I want my money back. The beam goes six feet, but I need to go about a mile. And the, the guy said, okay, let me give you the basic instruction here. Turn on, on. I've got that. I know that. Look at that, six feet. Step forward and look at the beam. Oh, my God, it's moving forward. <laughs> wow, I didn't know you. Look at that. Thank you. Thank you. I can now walk a mile with my flashlight. <laughs> now, we laugh at that silly illustration, but we're like that in the spirit. You know, we're like, God, show me. Ten miles down the road. And God says, I have shown you the next six feet. Walk in the light. As you walk in the light, the beam will move forward. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you, Jesus said. The Father loves me and shows me what to do. The light moves forward as I walk in the light that's given. Amen? You learned anything today? 
Practicing the presence of God is really simply a heart that's inclined towards God that says, I want your voice, I want your presence in my soulish realm, my mind, my will, and my emotions. Not just theoretically, not just positionally. Well, brother, don't you know that you're in Christ? I know that I'm in Christ, but I want to have a vital love relationship, intimacy with Him where I'm hearing. And it's not monologue, it's dialogue. It's not monologue, it's dialogue. Hallelujah. Just close your Bible up. I'm going to ask uh, Steve and some of the worship people to come on back and let's pick up on that song. Stand to your feet. Could we do that? Just stand to your feet. Let's just love on him a bit before we leave. We'll break and uh, you'll go to lunch and then we'll come back tonight. What time is tonight? Six o'clock tonight. We'll study more in this line and I just believe it's going to be a a day that you can advance a little bit, you know. You probably know a lot, but you can advance a little bit in the things of God. Start us off in, in, in some of that. Let's, let's sing it. True, sing it. Your presence is heaven to me. I want the pastor from Ethiopia to come up here. I want to minister over you, brother. You blessed my life today, saying that you had listened to Victory for today. That was a lot of years ago. Tell me your name again. Pastor Sam, Father, I thank you for what you're doing in Pastor Sam's life and the good report we heard today about the church. Lord, we're excited about that. We're excited for him and for his family and what you're doing. Lord, we bless him and we ask that there be an increase on his life. I pray that same spirit of increase that, that we've been experiencing at World Outreach is going to flow over onto Pastor Sam's life right now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Now, let me just talk to you a second. I'll tell you what, when you started speaking, let me tell you something I saw. And you just judge it and you weigh it in your own life, all right? I saw, I don't know, and it doesn't really matter. I don't know if you make trips ever back to Ethiopia or if you have contacts there or not. But the Lord said in my heart that He's going, and you need to be looking for this. I want you to be looking for this. He's going to connect you to a key church there. Maybe you know several, but there's going to be a key church he's going to connect you to. And it's going to be a divine connection. It's going to be one of those divine connections. And your church is going to help them and they're going to help you. And there's going to be a relationship between you and the pastor there. If you don't already have that, be looking for that. And the Lord, there's something there. There's something there that you're going to stay in communication. And, and these days we're talking about communication. You can do that through the internet, through Skype. You can do it through all kinds of ways. But you're also going to be making some annual trips where you're going to have the opportunity to preach. And you're going to, yes, thank you, Jesus. You're also going to have the opportunity to do some crusades and reach out. And this is going to become like a, a branch of your ministry. This is going to become a branch of your ministry. The Lord says, I will send you back. I will send you back. And when you go, you will go in with the anointing of an apostle. 
You're going to go in to plant churches and you're going to go in to raise up leaders and leadership meetings. You're going to go in and you're going to bless your homeland and I will send you back with the anointing of an apostle. You know what an apostle did? An apostle would plant churches, start things. You're going to start stuff. It's going to be more than churches. Woo! I'm telling you, I've seen a lot. I've seen a multifaceted outreach. I see where your church here is also going to be connected to an orphanage. I don't know how that's going to happen, but you're going to be helping a, a children's shelter, an orphanage type thing over there. And maybe it's not something you start. It may be something that you just help fund and finance. I don't know. That, those are the details where we walk in the spirit. God will show you. My job is just to kind of shotgun the big picture and, and your faith is going to go up through this. And the Lord says, I will direct your steps and I'll, you don't have to try to make this happen, okay? You just say, thank you, Lord. Uh, I'm walking with you and then the Lord, but when you're there, look for it. Keep your eyes open. Is this the guy? Is this the one? And then they'll, you'll sense a connection. And the Lord says, when you sense that connection, run with it. Father, we thank you for your ability to help him discern and to know and to hear and to see what is exactly right in that situation. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's go back to singing a little bit. Thank you, brother. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Your presence. Your presence. 